few years ago, I was working on my PhD, trying to finish it. I was working on aerial robotics on, on vehicles, not too uh, different from this one. And uh, of course, we were interested how aerial robotics, how drones, how they affected uh, the world outside, outside of our lab. And at that point, it didn't really seem like there was much of an impact. I mean, yeah, sure, there were gadgets. Uh, there were these vehicles that you can fly with your smartphones. But there were more toys and not really directly making uh, some, some social meaning. And I suppose one day I just kind of randomly came across this picture and that changed my perspective. This is a picture from Bolotnaya Square from Moscow. It's taken by Airpano. Uh, I have no relation to them, but they are a cool bunch of guys to let me use their picture. And it's, it's of the demonstration that took place after the federal elections in Russia two years ago. I'm officially Russian, so this kind of, I, I really care about this. And this was really strange because um, the, the, the demonstration itself, right? Uh, in Russia, it was a very unusual event that people actually came out really in mass to the streets to protest and to say that hmm, something isn't right. And for some reason, you, you could, didn't really see that in the world media. Um, but in this picture, in this one picture, in this panorama, you can, you can really see the event, the scale of it, the, the mass of it. It's just something you, you can no longer ignore, just from a single perspective. You know, if we fast forward two years, now I have a startup, we build something called the Photokite, which I'll show you shortly, which is a, a way for journalists to get these types of perspectives. But while doing this, I, I kind of got curious. You know, this technology, it must have been around for forever, right? Why, why hasn't it really been, why haven't I seen it used this way before? And I kind of came across this picture. So this, this is a picture from um, 1860 from Boston. That's a hundred, more than 150 years ago. This is one of the first aerial photos that uh, we have. But, but the real picture, I want to show you this one. This is from San Francisco, 1906. And I really want to pause here because many of us have, have these smartphones in our pockets, right? And they have 10 megapixel, 20 megapixel cameras. Awesome, we, we take pictures of our food, of cats. Th this guy, this is 1906. There was an earthquake in San Francisco. The, the city burned down, basically, completely destroyed. And this guy, George Lawrence, took a 20 kilogram camera that he constructed. It, it, there were a bunch of engineers working on this problem at the time. 20 kilogram camera that he put in the air with a piece of film that's one meter across, half a meter tall, and, and took this stunning panorama, right? 1906, okay? And you can actually zoom into this, just, just select one small part of this. You can actually see the individual people. It's crazy. Um, th th this, you know, it, it really shows you the, the potential of, of these perspectives and how a single picture can come across through more than a century so, in some ways, the stuff that we're doing, you know, it, it gives you a perspective. It, maybe it's not so new. Uh, and just as an aside, at the same time, people were putting cameras on all sorts of things. Uh, so that was actually a kite. You know, he, George Lawrence used a kite after surviving two hot air balloon accidents, and he started using kites for photography. Other people were using pigeons. It, actually, the photographs that resulted weren't so good. The miniaturization technology wasn't so great at the time. But they did it. Crazy. Um, this is the last picture I want to show you from the past. This is uh, 1946. This is the very first picture we have uh, of Earth from what we call space. It's a bit arbitrary, right? So, but this was taken from 100 kilometers above ground level, where the previous picture was taken at about 10, 20 kilometers above ground level. This picture was taken from a V2 rocket um, after the end of the World War II. Um, and the story of this, I, again, I just want to pause because it's so crazy how the technology evolves sometimes. The it, V2 was constructed in Nazi Germany as kind of the first cruise missile launched at places like London, right? Uh, when the World War II ended, Americans uh, and Russians, were, uh, Soviets, were trying to uh, take as much technology as they can to accelerate their own programs. So this particular V2 was smuggled from Nazi Germany after the end of World War II to Nevada, uh, launched for, well, really for research purposes as a test launch. Someone managed to put a camera in there. The thing took off, you know, gra gravity's rainbow, 100 kilometers above Earth, snapped this picture, crashed into the ground, uh, someone recovered the film, and this is the very first picture we have of Earth. 
Again, I work on this stuff. This story is pretty humbling to me, and, and it really gives perspective. Okay, how does this all make sense? So let, let's put all of these pictures together on a timeline. 1995, when one says the word drone, usually people think of the Predator drone that went into service in 1995. I would say that that's kind of, an, as an arbitrary marker, that's when drones become relevant to military. Um, and of course, that's a very complicated discussion. I'm, I'm as terrified of it as many of you are. But very recently, we've had this explosion of consumer drones kind of in this size. And why, why do we have all of these things? Well, I would say it's, it's really because of the smartphone. So the consumer electronics, the smartphone, it made uh, the inertial sensors very cheap. It made cameras very small, reliable, cheap. It made the processing uh, processors, uh, the manufacturing methods possible for, for these types of drones. But until recently, still, it's, it's more of a toy, more of a gadget. Nowadays, you really read every day that there is something happening with drones. Just this Monday, right, there was a game in Serbia, uh, Serbia versus Albania, where someone flew an off-the-shelf uh, phantom, whatever, you know, this quadrocopter with a flag, caused, um, caused some violence and actually stopped the game. So really, th these days you, re you read about them every day. But how did, how did the law, how did the regulation evolve, right? So we have a timeline here that goes more than 150 years in the past. Well, for a long time, uh, never mind about privacy, air ownership was as simple as if I, have, if I own this red circle, let's just imagine, I'm sure it's quite expensive, if I own this red circle, I own it uh, up to the heavens and down to hell, they would say, so, so forever. And, and this, this was, no joke, this, this was uh, British common law interpreted in you know, kind of the basis in many countries, in the, in the Western world at least, and th this lasted forever. In fact, in 1926, 1928, we already had very first uh, regular transatlantic air service. And still, the law was that if I own this circle, I own it forever. So, you know, there are some stories, it's really anecdotal, that the early planes, the early airliners, had to fly over public roads uh, when they actually flew over land. If you were over sea, it was, it was international waters, no problem. And only in 1946, and again, crazy technology story, this was a case involving chicken and military aircraft. Uh, there was a military airbase um, that was built, I suppose, for World War II, the aircraft were taken, over, to taken off very low over this guy uh, Cosby's farm and, and killing the chicken because they were so loud. This somehow percolated to the US Supreme Court and this kind of set the precedent again for much of the Western regulation. And eventually they decided that, yeah, indeed, these, these aircraft were a nuisance, they were flying too low. Uh, if they are a nuisance in your space, then they shouldn't be there. It, they're trespassing. And what they established for the first time is, is this rule that, well, you, actually, you own the airspace up to 100 meters or so, and then above that, it's, it's uh, public airspace, a public highway. Okay, that's air ownership, fun. Privacy. Uh, with drones, we always talk about privacy. Privacy wasn't, at least in the US, wasn't really uh, set until 1985. And I think this is some sort of an indicator for when this... Uh, aerial photography in general, never mind drones, actually became relevant to society. It was only 1985, there was a case, uh, Dow Chemical, a uh, huge chemi uh, chemical plant. They didn't like that the EPA flew a heli helicopter outside of the plant and took some pictures uh, without asking them. Uh, it went to the Supreme Court in the US and they said, yes, it is okay to take pictures from uh, public airspace. But only in 1985, right? Uh, with this more than 100 years after aerial photography kind of became possible. In, the, in Switzerland, I should actually mention, it, it's a bit different, especially recently. I guess the, the closest thing is, is the Google Street View case, um, where you know, Google, they send cars around to take pictures of, of streets from public roads and houses and stuff like that. Well, in Switzerland, uh, as a kind of an arbitrary Agreement two meters now is, is sort of the, the privacy threshold. If you put your camera above two meters, you're looking over fences and you're looking into people's private lives. If you're below two meters, then it's, it's a okay. Um, I, it's more complicated than that, of course. I'm not a lawyer, I should make this disclaimer. But it, it's interesting how this evolves. Okay, and here we are today with this picture. 
Clearly, uh, the rules have lagged quite a bit, and I think this is still a complicated issue of privacy. How do you balance these viewpoints, which I think are really you know, amazing, right? This, in a single picture, this communicates this event in a way that you really can't change or suppress or modify. Um, you want, in my opinion at least, you want to allow journalists and, and maybe certain professionals to get these viewpoints without hindrance, without looking for permission every time and stuff like that. But of course, how, how do you balance that against people's personal privacy? And, and in this case, I should note, this is in Russia, right? These guys uh, flew a six kilogram hexacopter up, you know, above this demonstration, and they were, they're really good professionals, they're really cool guys, but of course there's always a safety factor. They managed to get the right permission, they managed to fly it over a river to be safe, but this isn't always going to be possible. So, so how do we get these perspectives? Well, that's where we get to this beast, the photokite. And this is just one of, one of what I think will be a series of different new takes on tools to do aerial photography. I'm just going to show it to you how it works really quick. I just turn it on, I point it in the direction I wanted to fly. So I'm just flying it towards you guys. I'm not piloting it, right? And there's no one in the audience secretly holding a remote control. And it's actually tethered. That's, that's the big difference about it. It's always physically connected to me. So, so even the people in the audience in the front row, are you scared? Well, they feel, I hope, pretty safe because they see that this thing is actually restrained, it's thought. So even if this thing completely goes nuts, it's always, um, it's always restrained and, and you can see that it's, you're safe. But another big thing that this lets you do is that actually we, don't have a, we do have a small battery on board for backup purposes, but the main battery is right here. So now if I'm a journalist, I don't have to worry about flying this thing, I don't have to worry about the battery running out. I'm simply flying it as if it's a kite, but it's like an intelligent kite. So, in some ways, and this thing can follow me, they can do a little walk, walk in the photo kite demo. In some ways, it's funny because over 100 years ago, people were using kites to do aerial photography. And here we are in 2014, and I think we'll see more of these. We'll see a return to sort of kite drone hybrids. There is a video down link, so you can also plug this into your broadcast van and stream it to the world. So, okay, that's fun, hopefully, and hopefully useful. What, what's the observation here? Well, one, uh, of course, me personally and, and the, the team, the amazing people that I have working with me, we're working very hard to try to build a socially responsible uh, way to get aerial perspectives. But, but more, more generally, observations, I think that technology has to think not just about the user, the, the person using the device, but also more about the, the people, the bystanders. Of course, for example, in Japan, you know, when you take a picture with any device, it has to emit a sound, it has to show some sort of an indication. Maybe that's, some people will say that's limited or not, but I think we need something more like that, but self-regulating. That's one thing. The other thing is that when we build technology, um, I think that we should really try to think about its DNA. And as technologists, frequently we say we build it, we can't, we can't uh, control who uses it. I think that's really true. But we can try to influence it and we can try to build into the DNA of the, te the technology, the kind of the world we want to actually live in. So building not just for the future, but building for the future that we want to imagine for ourselves. Thank you.